So once again, by this Friday, 1 p.m., we'd like you to walk through the three short YouTube videos and answer a series of questions. And I will post that assignment um, before we start our class on Wednesday. And it doesn't take long to do, but it's just a pleasant, simple way of learning more about layer two devices. You'll have until 1 p.m. Wednesday next week to complete a 10-point solution where you're going to use Packet Tracer, but you're also going to do some things on your own home network. And the topic there is a multi-homed device. Once again, a multi-homed device is a device that is connected in more than one way. And I want you to understand what happens if you work with that device in a certain manner. There's a configuration option that can kind of turn it into a router or a bridge. And um, that's not intentional, but hackers like to do that. And so I'm revising the solution. We should be able to review the solution steps and tasks this next Wednesday in class. So on the 16th Wednesday, this Wednesday at 1 p.m., I'd like it if all of you could be here because we'll walk through the tasks for the solution. Um, this says Monday, but basically I'm gonna see where we are with the material cover uh, before we post the assessment. And I'd also like to get the retake for module one out there very soon. I've been working on all of the material and I just haven't got it posted yet, but I want you to have a chance to clear that out before we worry about the next assessment, which is why I have not, that's why it says TBA, right? Um, and of course you have a reconciliation and a retake the midterm exam is going to be posted so that you're finished with the midterm by 2nd of March, 2022. And the material for modules one and two will cover all of the materials that we would normally expect to cover in three modules. So module two is a larger, in terms of content, module two is a good bit larger. That's why there are so many student learning objectives, right? And I just wanted to explain all that before we got started today. Are there any questions before we take up where we left off on Friday? Any questions? Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, so what I'd like to do is blitz as fast as possible the rest of the slides from the textbook, right? Based on where we left off. And then I'm gonna circle back around and get into some of the study guide addendum and study guide uh, content. So I think this is where we left off. We said there were three different, three primary um, modes of, of transmission media that are in use now. One's electrical, one is light, and one is electromagnetic. And technically speaking, I want you to understand that from a physicist, from a physical science point of view, light is electromagnetic radiation. It's just visible. And when we have visible light, when we're dealing with types of light, you can use lasers with optical fiber, and it's the pulses of laser light that convey the digital information, okay? Infrared uh, light is often used in remote controls. Uh, and this has been around for a very long time, ever before we started having fiber optics, right? And lasers, uh, people had remote controls with infrared pulses uh, that would control TVs and VCRs and, you know, uh, cable boxes and such, right? So infrared remotes are basically um, pulses of light energy that are invisible. And it's the same thing that's used for a heat lamp in restaurants. So infrared um, light, it, when you look at a heat lamp in a restaurant, it often looks red, but infrared is invisible to the eye. Most of the light that comes out of that red light is invisible and it heats up the food. Any questions about infrared? Any so infrared is typically um, like TV remote stuff like that? Yes, typically. Okay. Typ Typically it is, but you'd be shocked at the amount of information that can be uh, transmitted, right? It's just mm -hmm. amazing, yeah. 
And <coughs> when you get into universal remotes, there's a lot of foolishness that can happen when it comes to the control of remote devices that um, are very easy hacks, but very troublesome hacks, especially in auditoriums with presentation equipment. Um, and that's another topic for another day, but um, it's kind of a fascinating area. What I'd like to do now is basically pick up where we left off then. So some really bad news in the real world entropy rules. Now, I want you to understand the term entropy. Everything has a, all right, so in the classical, in the classical concept that's presented by physicists, entropy is one of the laws of thermodynamics. It means that everything tends to a greater state of disorder. Put another way, stuff tends to break down and it tends to become more random, not less random. Entropy means it's, it's a law of the universe. So if you have things that are organized and um, arranged in a certain manner over time for all sorts of reasons, they're not so organized and, and they're not so structured. And in the real world, uh, you know, metal tarnishes, uh, stuff breaks down. There's all sorts of issues. In fact, one of the classic fixes that happens with help desk counters, like in, at Best Buy, in, in, there's a chain of electronic stores in the United States called Best Buy. We don't have them here, but there are some Best Buy stores in Puerto Rico. And they have uh, a counter where you can bring in your computers. And if you have problems with your computers, there's a squad they call the Geek Squad. And one of the first things the Geek Squad does is they take all of the parts and they unplug and replug the parts. And that's all they do. In other words, they, you know, somebody brings it in, they say, oh, the sound isn't working. Oh, the Wi Fi is barfed. Oh, the network isn't functioning properly. I've got hard disk problems. My memory is, I'm getting memory errors. And, and they, they take notes, but then they, open up the machine or device and they disconnect and reconnect. And when they reconnect, they're scraping the oxidation, which is there because of entropy. Everything, everything degrades or deteriorates with time. It has a, in classical terms, we say there's a greater disorder, right? Everything tends toward a state of greater disorder. This includes things like rust and corrosion and uh, just, just plain getting old and breaking, right? Getting brittle. So what they do is they disconnect and reconnect. And what happens is that as they reconnect, it's called reseating the connection. You are re-terminating or reseating, as in seat, the kind of thing you sit in, S-E-A-T. We are reforming the connection, reseating the connection, Reterminating the connection. And when we basically unplug, replug, unplug, replug, unplug, replug things a few times, the corrosion on those contacts tends to scrape off and then you have a fresh connection. And transmission is plagued with problems that have to do with entropy, especially network copper and radial. In particular, wired, wired transmissions are particularly susceptible to a electromagnetic interference. So what can happen is that there's noise. Uh, a good example of this are fluorescent lights. In the overhead space above an office, there are often copper network ethernet cables. If a work crew is uneducated, untrained, and they simply run the wire in the ceiling above and then down the wall, if that wire in the ceiling lays near or across large power lines or a fluorescent light, the electrical noise from that fluorescent, fluorescent light will squelch the ones and zeros that are traveling on that wire. And it leads to distortion, interference, and loss, okay? In layman's terms, every time you're running electricity on a wire, you have things like resistance, which uh, is just um, 
Well, it's exactly what it says it is, the resistance to the flow of electrons, right? And then capacitance that can distort or warp a signal and then inductance, right? Inductance is when you have these magnetic fields near a wire and it creates this electric interference. So it leads to interference, inductance. I don't know if you know this, but you can take a 100 foot, this is kind of fun to do, get a 100 foot extension cord. If you know of anyone that has a 100 foot extension cord, walk out into your front yard with it, then loop it so it's 100 feet looped in half. Then get two people with strong arms to do some, uh, some rope jumping. Uh, the kind of thing you do for double dutch, only just, just swing that thing like, you, like someone's doing some jump rope, right? They're jump roping. And uh, in fact, it's probably best if somebody does get them in the middle and then swing the, the extension cord so that they can jump the rope, use it as a rope. At the same time, have a friend hook up a voltmeter. And what you'll see is you'll see the voltmeter go like this and like this and like this and like this in time with the loop, the loop, the loop of the, of the uh, extension cord. I'm not making this up. The magnetic field of the earth is in the air. As you loop the, the extension cord, a hundred feet of it, and it's, it's basically in one giant loop. When you swing that thing like a, like a jump rope, uh, basically what's happening is that it's moving in the presence of a magnetic field, and that leads to the generation of electricity. In fact, when electricity is generated, you're moving a conductor in the presence of a magnetic field or moving the magnetic field in the presence of a stationary conductor. And that generates a current of electrons in the wire. It's a fascinating field of physics. And if you haven't learned or remember that much from your physical science days, I want you to understand this is a really big thing when it comes to electrical base, electrical media used for uh, networking, right? So if you don't have a good ground, you're screwed. If you have lots of interference, then you're screwed. If you have poor connections between uh, when, uh, joints and stuff, then, then you're screwed. And on the physical layer, if you basically take care of those things, you have a lot less trouble. Usually when you have problems with networking, it's one of those three things, right? It's one of those three things. Random electromagnetic radiation is called noise. True story, I used to work tech, healthcare technology at a hospital, and they had an x-ray machine. And every time the x-ray machine fired off, it pulled 50 amps of electricity, a huge amount of electricity in a short period of time through a very large cable. This generated a very large electromagnetic field. And every time the, the x-ray machine fired off, the data on the network would, in the nearby uh, screens would fall, it would fail. And that was because of the noise. And all we had to do was put a metal plate in between where the x-ray machine was and the network switch. And, and then everything stopped, right? Electric motors are another source of this. If you have an electric motor, electric motor as it's operating, if you have a network cable that's too close to an electric motor, it can be an, an issue. Now here's the other problem too. Has anyone ever heard of solar flares? Anyone? Yes. Solar, solar flares? Okay. So the sun, can sort of vomit or uh, spit up, right? Um, just think of the sun, our sun is kind of like a baby star and it spits up. And when it spits up, it belches all of this solar radiation and that can disrupt Wi-Fi, it can disrupt cell signals, it can disrupt, it can disrupt uh, electro, it can, it, can, it can even disrupt cables. So if you have, Ethernet cables embedded inside a building and you have a metal roof, it can still cause a problem there unless the cable is shielded. There is a shielded type of cable called shielded twisted pair. We'll talk about twisted pair cables in just a minute. But the shielded has a foil wrap of metal all around the main jacket of the cable. And then what's inside is protected from this radiation. Any questions about loss interference and electrical noise? 
Hey, um, Dr. Kentop, would that also affect satellites? Yes. The short answer is, since satellites use a lot of uh, data signals and electromagnetic signals, and they're based on radio frequencies, just not the same as Wi-Fi. Yes, absolutely it would. And I, um, I saw an article, I didn't read it. I just, I, I, I saw it when I was um, Googling some, and it said um, Starlink lost like 40 satellites due to um, a solar flare, that was like last week. Yes. And that's significant because you have to harden, uh, if you have a satellite that's susceptible to universal radiation or radiation from the, our solar system and from our sun, it's really important to shield those satellites properly or they'll fry. Yeah. Okay, so here are other examples, right? When electrical signals propagate down a wire, electromagnetic energy is radiated. The wire acts like an antenna, like a radio antenna. Now you may or may not know this, but sharks have an organ in their snout called the ampullae of Lorenzini. And when your nerves operate, your nerves propagate an, a change in electrical charge down the length of your nerve, from your brain to your spine, out to your peripheral. And it's, it's much more subtle and it's much slower than regular electricity. But moving electrons and moving charge still generate an electromagnetic field. And recent studies have shown that sharks can tell if you're alive in the water just because your nerves are pulsing nerve signals, right? So this happens even in a biological system. Now, when electromagnetic radiation encounters metal, a small electrical current is induced. That's the, the rope jumping with an extension cord I was just talking about. When an electric pulse is sent down an unterminated wire, a reflection comes back. Now, this is kind of fun. But when, these, when we say we have an unterminated wire, what we mean is that it's open. You have an open circuit. So you have a wire connected on one end, but then the other end isn't well connected. And when an electric pulse is sent down that way, it'll reach the end and it'll come right back at you. And that's bad. If you don't understand that's how this works, you can fry stuff right in front of you because when it comes back, it's like a boomerang and it hits pretty hard. When a signal passes across the connection between two wires, reflection and loss occurs. Now, this is one reason why we twist wires. You're gonna see in just a minute, we talk about twisted pair in ethernet. And in fact, the ethernet standard right now requires four pairs of wire that are twisted so many times every inch. And it's this twist that creates a counter signal that cancels out the signal in the pair of wires next to it. What am I saying? By twisting the wires, the interference is canceled and we get a better, uh, we get better data transmission. We'll, you'll see a diagram about that in just a minute. It says, note, a network diagnostic tool uses reflection to find the distance to the point where a cable has been cut. So you can connect a, uh, a tool to an ethernet cord. It'll tell you how long the, co the, the cord is. And that's because it, it creates connections to the wires, but then instead of forming the full connection, it leaves one end open and then it pulses the wire uh, electric signal out. And when it comes back, it can tell how, how long the cable is. It's actually pretty cool. Now we talked about unshielded twisted pair. Several techniques have been invented to reduce the effect of noise on copper wiring. Coax cable is one of the most familiar when you have ca coax cable. This is your cable company, right? They give you a single thick black round cable and people plug it into the back of their TV or they plug it into their, their uh, cable box, right? And that coax cable is actually a single copper wire surrounded by foil and surrounded again by a plastic jacket to hold the foil in place. And that foil keeps the noise from happening. Coax cable runs can actually run longer than 300 feet. When it comes to standard ethernet, 
un unshielded twisted pair and shielded twisted pair uh, both have like a 300 foot limitation in practical terms. Remember, we talked about that last week. Everybody remembers 300 feet, right? Football field, length of the football field. Yeah. Hello. Everybody remembers we talked about the length of a football field, 300 feet, 100 yards. Yes. Okay. Now, I want you to think about this a second. If you have a 300 foot length and then you put a switch in there and then you run another 300 feet, what's 300 plus 300? Um, 600. Exactly, exactly. So if you put a switch or a hub or a repeater in the middle, what can happen is that the signal starts to die at the 300 foot mark, but then that repeater or switch or hub strengthens that same signal, the ones and zeros, the binary information, and then it goes another 300 feet, right? And so that's how they, they set up relays, right? They, they, string, they string network equipment together to overcome distance limitations. And in fact, the entire global internet is a series of interconnected local networks or broadcast domains that are limited by about 300 feet. Now, here's probably the best diagram to explain. When we have a source of radiation, let's pretend we have a fluorescent light in an office. Let's just keep it simple, okay? We don't have gamma rays because we're not talking about the Incredible Hulk. We're not talking about x-rays at a hospital and we're not talking about solar radiation. Let's just use an everyday example. There are so many fluorescent lights in our environment, it's scary. And you go to office buildings, you go to schools, you go to government buildings, you go to stores. In your own home, you have fluorescent lights in the ceiling. That fluorescent light creates an electromagnetic, it's called a potential, right? So you have this difference in electromagnetic radiation strength between the two wires, if you have a pair of wires. Well, this creates a problem especially if they're connected at the other end to form a circuit. So what happens is that scientists, well, actually engineers realized if we twist those wires, what happens is that the blue has a plus three, a plus five, a plus three, a plus five, and then the gray has a plus five, a plus three, a plus five, a plus three. So if we just have two wires next to each other in parallel without twists, we have a problem whenever there's interference, whenever there's a source of radiation. But if we twist the wires, there's zero difference. So it exposes each wire equally and it cancels out the interference so that you can ba basically get good data across a distance. And without that, you're screwed. Let me say that again. If you have just straight wire, you're screwed. If you don't have twisted pair, you're in trouble. And there are different standards for twisted pair. The first standards were like twisted pair category one and category three. The term category is often shortened to use, you'll hear people talking about cat five and cat six, that's category five and category six. The higher the category number, the greater the number of twists in a given distance. The first digital telephones, not analog telephones, but truly digital telephones used cat three. I started using like category two and category three uh, ethernet cable. And uh, by the time we got to 100 megabit um, data speeds, we were using category five, which means that there were a whole lot more twists for given uh, distance. Here's a picture of coax cable shielding. You see the outer plastic, and then you see this, uh, it looks like metal mesh. Sometimes it's foil. So it can be foil or it can be mesh. Then you have inner plastic insulation, and then you have an inner wire for the signal. So there's basically a sheath of metal, and when there's interference, it hits that mesh and it's blocked. This effect is known as a Faraday. All right, so there was a 
scientist by the name of Faraday, and he understood that if you create a cage and you put people inside that cage, nobody outside the cage can figure out what's going on with the electromagnetic signals from their devices. And well, it's a little bit, there's a little bit more to it than that, but basically a Faraday cage is when you create a container that people can walk into a room and the entire room is shielded like this in metal mesh or in chain link or in foil, and people outside that cannot pick up on your electromagnetic signals. This is also the principle that's used to protect mobile devices from hackers in a crowded environment, like a, like a hotel or an airport. It's called a black bag. You basically put your tablets and your cell phones inside this, this uh, envelope and the envelope is made of this stuff. And if a hacker sits next to you in an airport, they can't get into your phone because they can't connect. It also means you can't receive telephone calls, right? You can't receive text messages. You're disconnected from the network, but at least your device isn't gonna be hacked. Any question about how this shielding works? Um, 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 yes, yeah, so um, so uh, the, 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 um, does one see in, see in, they come, they come, po, 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 po. protects, protects me and get against hackers in a way? Yes. The short answer is yes. Shielding protects you against hackers, but it also improves the efficiency, the efficiency of the network signal. So your network works better, better. You have higher data rates, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So your networks can operate at higher speed with confidence because you're not losing all that data. You're not losing digital information because of interference or or due to hacking, right? Mm -hmm. So yes, this, this is um this is good. This is this is um, um cool and great. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Yeah. Now here you see the data rates that are possible with each of the different categories of twists. So when we talk about the twisted pair, the higher the category, the greater the number of twists. And you see how fast, right? We get to the place where we're doing 600 megabits for CAT7. It's actually a gigabit. Now, this slide is no longer true. This, this slide should be updated to show that CAT's from 5E through 7, they figured out a way to actually transmit an entire gigabit of data per second. And with CAT6, they can do 10 gig. So it's 10,000 instead of 200 or 600. So that's one thing I'm going to put in your addendum. I'm going to say that Due to, due to recent advances in the transmission protocols that are used to process the signals and superior multiplexing and um, modulation, what we're able to do is squeeze more data out of the same cable. So CAT5e is kind of a tipping point. Anything that's CAT5 and older tends to have problems with data rates more than 100 megabits per second. Now, when I say bit, I mean there's eight bits in a byte. So we're talking about 12.5 megabytes per second on a connection across a cable network. And that's many times faster than Wi-Fi. Okay, so just to keep it in perspective, right? CAT5e and six and seven with those new advancements can go a gigabit all the way to 10 gigabits with the right, with the right uh, interfaces, right? Any questions about uh, ethernet and electric before we get into laser light and fiber optics? Okay, so let's talk about fiber optics and light for a minute. There is a type of laser we can use between buildings. It's often called optical wireless, point-to-point -point lasers. Optical fiber is a strand of glass 
And of course, infrared is that remote control in your, in your dad's hand when he's changing channels on the TV. There's no glass or fiber involved and there's no laser. It's just a pulse of, of infrared light, right? Low data rate, just enough to control a device, change channels, increase or decrease the volume, that kind of thing. When you get to fiber optics, when you have a glass fiber, it's this business here that allows the light to stay inside the fiber. The fiber is polished on the outside. So it's like a mirror on the outside. Let me say this again. The outside of the fiber, it's a tube, it's a glass tube, it's highly polished. And because it's highly polished, it acts like a mirror. So when you shine a laser into the end of it, it tends to reflect, it kind of ricochets all the way down inside the glass fiber. Now, there are other phenomenon in physical science that you have to be concerned with when you're using fiber optics, things like refraction. What, what's that? When you have a change in materials, there tends to be a shift in the angle of transmission. So if you're shining a light in air and it hits water, then the light is now going this way instead of going straight. That's one reason why you have a hard time catching a fish you can see from above the top of the water. Because as you're looking above the water at a fish, your eye sees through the air and then it has to see through the water. And unless you know that you're supposed to grab above or below that fish, you're never gonna catch the fish and the fish always get away. But people that are used to like plunging their arms down into the water to grab a fish, they kind of know this. They know they have to shoot high or low, depending on the circumstances and where they're standing and which angle they're using when they're looking at the fish. Absor absorption is another phenomenon to be concerned with. The less pure the glass fiber, the more absorption, the more the light is absorbed, which means it can't shine as far. That's where lasers come in. When you use lasers with a fiber optic cable, it's, it's very concentrated light. It's called coherent light. All the waves are in concert. They work together. And that's why they're able to go much further. But absorption is one of those things that happens because nothing is completely pure. Now, here's where we get into the business about talking about how Wi-Fi and wireless is really related to the laser fiber optics kind of thing. In science, whenever you have this electromagnetic spectrum of radiation, right? So when atoms and molecules are vibrating, they create this electromagnetic spectrum. They, they create electromagnetic waves. And these waves at low frequencies, we would call them radio and TV. At a certain wavelength, we'd call them microwaves. That's what 2.4 gigahertz is. So from one gigahertz to 2.4 gigahertz, that's considered microwave. When the wavelength is even smaller, it's considered infrared. And then there's this band right here called visible light. So radio waves, when you get to a higher frequency, our eyes are organs that are designed to see visible light. But what we're really seeing are radio waves, electromagnetic radio waves in the air. But we see it and perceive it as light. There are some animals that can see infrared and UV. Let me say that again. There are some living organisms that are capable of detecting and responding to non-visible wavelengths of, right, of light in the same way that dogs can hear frequencies that we cannot. Everybody knows that a dog can hear a very high-pitched frequency, even with human, even when humans can't, right? You've heard of a dog whistle, right? Everybody knows what a dog whistle is? Yeah, I know what it is. So if you blow a dog whistle, you can't even hear it. You think, oh, this, this is broken. Every dog hears it because it shrieks a very high pitched squeal and their ears are capable of hearing ultrasonic frequencies, high, high pitched frequencies 
those are very low wavelengths. So the smaller the wavelength, the more energy and more data. Let's say that again, the smaller the wavelength, the more energy and the more data. One of the things that I want you to understand though, and this is huge, is that if you have very low frequencies, they can reflect off of the layers of the atmosphere, okay? If you've heard of shortwave radio, what happens is that a shortwave radio has a wavelength that's so, the frequency is so low, meaning the length of the wave is so long that when the antenna puts out that radio signal, it can hit the upper atmosphere of the earth and it's bounced back. And so it's like ricochets back around inside the, the atmosphere of the earth. And that's why you can, people at a short wave radio can hear each other, even though they're on the other side of the world. But if they're broadcasting with FM radio or TV frequencies, those are blocked by physical things, right? It's blocked by obstructions. So higher frequency radio signals must have what's called line of sight. This is really important. Wave travels in a direct line and it'll be blocked by obstructions. Does anyone know what the tipping point is for distance when it comes to the curvature of the earth? Anyone? Eleven miles. So if you if you shoot a laser for eleven miles, what happens is that if there's somebody standing over on St. Thomas on the beach and somebody standing on St. Croix on the beach, there's about forty miles between St. Croix and St. Thomas. And if you want to shoot a laser from that person to the other person, you can physically. The problem is, is that there's the curve of the water and the earth between St. Thomas and St. Croix. The only thing you can hit is the top of the mountains on St. Thomas. Because that straight line, the curve of the earth starts to curve down. And it's only the high mountains that are still visible to the laser from more than 11 miles away. Okay, everybody understand that curve of the earth. The earth's curvature on level terrain. That's where satellite communication becomes all the rage, right? If you put satellites in the atmosphere above us and then you bounce radio waves to and from the satellite, the important thing to understand is that there's two kinds of satellites. There's satellites that revolve around over our head so they spin around the earth and they have a rotation, they have a revolution period or a rotate, they're not rotating, they're revolving around the earth. They have an orbit. The term is, the common term is orbit. So they're, they're they have an orbit around the earth. The, the satellites that are most valued for communication purposes are ones called geostationary earth orbit, geo. Those satellites are far enough away and they're moving at the same speed the earth revolves on its axis. So as the, as the earth spins and revolves, as it rotates, the satellite is far enough out and it matches the same place. It's just further out. So it's, the, it's a far enough distance away and it's moving fast enough where it, it stays in the same place overhead. So when you look up, if you're standing in your front yard and you look up and you can see one of the Starlink satellites by Elon Musk, that's a geostationary Earth orbit satellite, okay? These other satellites uh, basically are, they're in play and you can see them and connect to them and you can transmit data only when they're overhead. But when they're on the other side of the earth, you can't see them. So low earth orbit and medium earth orbit aren't, aren't as good as far as satellite communications. But the one that really makes uh, the most sense is this geostationary earth orbit. Any questions about satellite communication and the different types? Just remember geostationary earth orbit is the one that remains in a fixed position, but the disadvantage is that it's farther away and it's moving faster. So you have to be able to use, you have to use more energy to get to that thing, even though it doesn't move. You can communicate with lower uh, 
Leo and Mio, right? But only while they're within range and you have to have antennas that can move and point at them because they're moving across the sky very fast. So that's kind of tricky. And this is what the original satellites were like. The original satellites weren't geostationary. Scientists and engineers took some years to figure out how to put a satellite above our head where it stayed put. But they had to put it far enough out and they had to, the speed had to be just right or it wouldn't stay over our head. It would get a little to the east or a little to the west. It, would, it wouldn't, wouldn't remain in a fixed position. Any questions about satellite? So when you're talking about a geo satellite, if you're here on the top of the big E in St. Thomas or St. Croix, your geo satellite will be right above you and it won't ever move. It'll be far enough away and it'll be moving fast enough that it keeps up with the rotation of the earth. So relative to where you are, as you move through the hours of the day, it stays and keeps pace with you, okay? Any questions about how that works? Okay, in the time remaining, I'm gonna try to move very fast with some of the rest of this stuff, right? So you don't have to know all of this, but it's good information to understand, if, especially if you use a lot of uh, satellite stuff for data transmission. When you use satellites for data transmission, there's something called latency, meaning there's lag in the transmission because it's so long for that stuff to transmit, right? Even at the speed of light. So what happens is that there's a delay in terms of the send and receive. It's not as instantaneous, right? The distance of geo satellite is 22,236 miles. So that's a number that I suspect you wanna remember because it's that far away from you in the sky. It has to be 22,236 miles above you and it has to be moving so fast that it basically will keep pace with the rotation of the earth, right? Approximately three times the earth diameter or one tenth of the distance to the moon. So those geo satellites are out a ways from earth. It's far off the page, right? which means that there are delays in the transmission of the data. There's also a maximum data rate. If you have 100 people sharing a single satellite, each one gets one one hundredth of the capable transmission data. If you have 1,000, then each one of them gets one thousandth of the potential transmission capacity of that satellite, and so on. Any questions about that? Now, I don't expect you to know these mathematical algorithms. I don't want you to memorize Shannon's algorithm. I just want you to know that uh, signal to noise ratio. So uh, basically Nyquist theorem talks about how much bandwidth you can put on a signal. So Nyquist's theorem, you, you wanna know that has to do with calculating the bandwidth for a given transmission media. That's the only one that I expect you to know uh, verbatim. So you can increase the signal and that increases the data rate, maybe. But Shannon's theorem basically says the electrical noise can limit that past a point. So, so according to Nyquist, if you increase the signal and you uh, improve the signal and how it's modulated and multiplexed, you can get more data. But Shannon's theorem says, hey, uh, because of other limitations in the environment, there's an upper limit to that. You're never going to get it. It's not perfect, right? Which is why we're not just uh, beaming things. I think at this point, what we're going to do is we're going to stop and talk about error correction on our class on Wednesday, and we'll finish up the series of slides, and we'll review as much as we can in the study guide. We'll also take a look at the first tasks that you'll need to perform for your solution. So today what we've done is taken a good look at the electrical and fiber optic and satellite, in particular radio that has to do with satellite um, methods of networking. What we're going to do, um, 
What we're going to do Wednesday is focus on how the modulation and multiplexing, how the upper layer protocols make sure that we're getting better data on those signals. So today was really all about the signals. Any questions before we conclude today? No, I don't have a question. Okay. Thank you for joining us. Keep your eyes peeled for the module one retake, the final assessment, um, the version for the final assessment for module one. You'll see it out there sometime between now and Wednesday's class, and you'll have a couple of days to take it. Okay.